This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Sue Herrera. Solid but not stellar. More than 200,000 jobs were created last month. Wage growth was positive but tepid. Is it enough to tip the Fed's hand? Dollar Dilemma, the red-hot greenback cast a shadow over earnings, but our market monitor has a list of stocks that he says will stay cool as the dollar heats up. And bright idea, meet the former pro football player whose business plan started with a Google search. All that and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Friday, August 7th. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Tyler Matheson. Sue Herrera has the evening off. Well, the streak continues. The economy has created 200,000 jobs or more in 15 of the past 17 months. 215,000 positions were added in July, with the unemployment rate steady at 5.3 percent. Wages nudged up just slightly while the share of Americans participating in the labor force remains stuck at a 38-year low. But experts say the overall report is proof the recovery is chugging along and likely keeps the Federal Reserve on track for its first interest rate hike since 2006. Hampton Pearson has more on the numbers and what they mean for Main Street and Wall Street. Good work. For the first seven months of this year, job growth has been widespread, averaging 212,000 jobs per month. Healthcare continues to lead, up 436,000 for the year, including 28,000 last month. Retailers have added 322,000 new employees as consumer spending picks up. And it was another strong month for professional and technical services, up 27,000, topping 301,000 for the year. Those booming auto sales helped manufacturing have its best month of the year. Workers' hours increased, but wage growth remained stagnant. Overall, a steady-as-she-goes job market for the Obama White House. It was very much on target. You just look, 15 of the last 17 months, this economy has created over 200,000 jobs. It just month after month, you know, keeps adding to those jobs. That's broadly been bringing the unemployment rate down. The Washington, D.C. area is experiencing many of those same trends rebounding from the recession. In fact, the region is experiencing the biggest year-over-year -year growth in jobs since the economy stalled here two years ago. Nearly 70,000 new jobs have been added to the regional economy in the last 12 months, with high tech and health care leading the way. The 4.8 percent unemployment rate is below the national average. We don't really have gains in federal employment in D.C., in the D.C. area, but we do see the private sector making up for that, and indeed it's really been a boom economy here in D.C. in recent years. Today's headline job growth fits the Fed criteria for further improvement in the job market, prompting most economists to say a September rate hike is very much on the table. I do think that this is a, one more sort of steady step along the way towards the Fed likely hiking in September. I think it's more likely than not. I don't think it's quite a done deal. Uh, we've got five weeks of data and we've learned anything in the last several years. A lot can happen in five weeks. September's jobs report could be decisive as the central bank moves closer to the biggest change in interest rate policy in nearly a decade. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Hampton Pearson in Washington. And look who's here to discuss today's big jobs report, the man you just saw in Hampton's piece. Welcome to you, Michael Hansen, senior economist at Bank of America. Good to have you with us. I take it that you're in the camp that uh, believes that it is probably a little more than likely that the Fed will raise rates in September. There was nothing in this report that uh, changes your mind on that, is there? No, if anything, I would say it probably nudged the Fed a little bit closer to a September rate hike. I mean, the one thing, as you pointed out, that was a little bit soft was wages, mm -hmm. but payroll growth has been strong. The unemployment rate's getting close to the level where the Fed starts to think the labor market's getting a little bit tight. So I think it very much leaves September in play. How strong is economic growth overall? And are we at uh, a sort of a, a level that we should just get accustomed to, 2.5 to 3 percent a year? Yeah, 2.5 to 3 percent is probably above the long run trend, given the, the fundamentals in the economy right now. Uh, it's enough to probably keep job growth for a little while in this 200,000 range, and it probably is not going to get to 4 or 5 percent anytime soon, unfortunately. Well, I, I was going to pick up on that, because if you watched the debates last night, sure. uh, Jeb Bush said that he thinks a target that we should aim for is 4 percent in the economy. He said, uh, he confessed that that is an aspirational target. Is it a practical one? It, it would be tough. I think it, it would be difficult, given some of the changes in the fundamentals. For example, we have a declining labor force. 
Mm -hmm. And that certainly is weighing on growth. I think we've seen a number of factors uh, post the financial crisis slow down the pace of growth a bit, and they may take a while to turn around. I was speaking earlier today to our Steve Leisman, our economics reporter, and I was asking him about why labor force participation is as stubbornly low as it is. How do you explain it? Well, a good chunk of it is, is demographics. Uh, baby boomers are a big part of that, you know, obviously moving into retirement age. Mm -hmm. You've seen some younger workers, though, also have a tendency to stay in school longer, and therefore, on average, ah. people in teens and early 20s aren't coming to the labor force as much as they used to. Uh, they'll not, of course, retire themselves. They'll come back eventually, but not at the earlier stage. Let's go back to the question of interest rates. You, you're of the view that they probably will start doing something in September. Do you believe that then they will be moving interest rates up pretty regularly, most meetings, if not every meeting, and, and how steeply? Yeah, well, the Fed has said they're going to be gradual, but that's not a promise. That's a forecast. And because the Fed has very much emphasized data dependence, I think we're going to have to wait and see. Given we talked about the fact that trend growth is a little bit slower and it's, of course, the case that wages and inflation aren't rising very quickly, I think the Fed can very much be patient, which probably means quite less often than every, every meeting. Is a patient pace of interest rate hikes in any real sense a major danger to people's portfolios quickly? Uh, I don't think so because the Fed is going to hike as the economy gets better. We don't want the Fed prematurely hiking and potentially have things fall back because that would be, in the end, bad for portfolios. Michael, thanks very much for being with us. Certainly. Appreciate thank you. it. Thank you. Michael Hansen of the Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Well, with cyber attacks a near daily occurrence for companies, employers are looking hard now for workers who can protect them. In the latest in our series, Where the Jobs Are, Mary Thompson looks at the world's growing need for cyber warriors from Symantec's Global Operations Center in Herndon, Virginia. In the war against cyber criminals, 30-year-old Richard Hobson is one of the newest recruits. What I like best is it doesn't feel like a job. A former welder, Hobson now interns at Morgan Stanley, having completed a three-month training program called SC3, or Semantic Cyber Career Connection. We're looking for any vulnerabilities, any threats that can compromise personal information and data that's highly regarded to the organization. Costing businesses an estimated half a billion dollars a year, cyber attacks show no signs of slowing down. And that's fueling growth in a sector Semantic estimates will have 6 million jobs by 2019, but only 4.5 million people to fill them. And the market's hot right now because every time you open up a newspaper, there's another cybersecurity attack going on. The higher demand means higher salaries. The job analytics firm Burning Glass Technology says on average cybersecurity jobs pay $84,000 a year. That's 9% more than your typical IT job. Still, these positions are tough to fill. Burning Glass CEO Matthew Siegelman says that's because candidates need technical chops and a deep knowledge of the industries they'll defend, like healthcare, retail, or finance. About 84% of cybersecurity jobs require a college degree. 70% of them require multiple years of experience in a field that really didn't exist multiple years ago. So to build a pipeline of workers, Symantec's head of human resources, Amy Capilanti-Wolf, is looking beyond the walls of higher education and expanding SC3, a program focused on training minorities and women. 80% of them um, have GED or equivalent degrees. So it's a workforce that you wouldn't normally have access to or they wouldn't have access to. Hobson is among 31 SC3 graduates who take courses including ethical hacking and security plus. It's changed my life in many ways. And for Symantec, it's changing the way it develops workers to fill critical jobs available now and in the future. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Mary Thompson in Herndon, Virginia. To read more about the growing need for cybersecurity professionals, head to our website, nbr.com. Well, the jobs report and expectations for a rate hike weighed on the market this day, sending the Dow Jones Industrial Average lower for the seventh straight session. The index's longest such losing streak since August of 2011, one of the bumpiest months of the past decade. Uh, the blue chip Dow index dropped 46 points to 17,373. NASDAQ fell a dozen, and the S&P 500 was off a half a dozen. For the week, all the major averages were lower by more than 1%, as you see there. Crude prices fell for a sixth straight week, settling in at $43.87 a barrel. That is a new multi-month low. The Dow component American Express helped offset some of the pressure from the jobs report and oil's decline today. The stock rose more than 6% on heavy volume 
on word that the activist hedge fund Value Act took a $1 billion stake in the firm. In a statement, American Express said it respects Value Act and has been speaking with them, as it does with other big investors. And still ahead, stocks that can escape the heat from the hot dollar. Our market monitor is coming up. Booking firm Sabre says its systems were hacked. Bloomberg News also reporting that American Airlines is examining whether its network was breached. It is believed to be the work of the same hackers that targeted the health insurance firm Anthem back in February and the U.S. government's personnel office in June. For a new era for the global trade, we recently told you about all the business being done at the major U.S. ports. Now, across the globe, the Suez Canal, through which flows 8% of the world's sea trade, just got bigger. And as Hadley Gamble reports, it could mean a smoother passage for the shipping industry and the fragile Egyptian economy. It was a historic day for Egypt, replete with pomp and pageantry, and a major political victory for the country's president. A new Suez Canal, 22 miles long, carved out of the Egyptian desert in just under a year at a cost of $8.5 billion, all financed by the Egyptian public. But with analysts already speculating that the government's figures are overly optimistic, a potential windfall of as much as $13.5 billion in increased transit revenues over the next five years, it's the economic zones plan for around the canal that the government hopes will rake in the long-term cash. And it's that long-term investment and job growth that Egypt so desperately needs. As Gulf governments begin to tighten the purse strings, the pressure is on President Sisi to perform. When you come to the conference like this, you can almost feel the economic engine of Egypt starting to rev up. A string of multi-billion dollar deals announced in Sharm el-Sheikh in March with the likes of BP and Siemens were a start. And a look at the guest list in Suez, leaders from the Gulf, Africa, Russian Prime Minister Medvedev and President Hollande of France may shed some light on where the president is hoping to find strategic partners for investment next. Earlier this week, the Obama administration reaffirmed a commitment to deliver eight F-16 aircraft suspended indefinitely after the overthrow of former President Mohamed Morsi. Secretary Kerry delivered the good news but was notably absent today. While the presence of so many leaders from the Gulf comes as no surprise given the major monetary commitments over the last few years just to keep the country in the black, President Hollande and Russian Prime Minister Medvedev do reflect a widening of the net, a growing cooperation that's translating into new economic and military deals. Now, when you speak to Egyptian officials, they do say that this is all about maintaining economic stability over the long term. But for many privately, they also speculate that this is as much about geostrategic realignment as it is about financial opportunity. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Hadley Gamble on the banks of the Suez Canal. Hershey's sales are flat for the first time in years, and that is where we begin tonight's market focus. The maker of Reese's peanut butter cups and other treats like Hershey Kisses saw volume slip in North America because of price increases and weak demand from China. The company also cut its full-year sales forecast uh, for 2015. Shares fell more than 2.5% to 89.73. Sotheby's saw its profits and sales slip in the latest quarter. The auction house blamed currency headwinds and losses from the sale of a single painting. Those dented the results there. Shares tumbled 7.5% today to 37.49. Cablevision had subscriber growth in its most recent quarter. The company managed to beat estimates on both the top and bottom lines. Still, shares slipped on this down day for the market. More than 2.5%. They finished at 25.82. The credit card lender Capital One Financial in talks now to acquire General Electric's healthcare finance unit. That, according to Reuters, the deal will likely top $10 billion. GE off a fraction. It finished at $25.79. Capital One fell slightly to $80.82. 
Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway said second quarter operating profit fell 10 percent to about $4 billion. The decline reflects weaker results in its insurance operations. The A shares didn't move much in after hours trading, but they declined in the regular session to end the day at $215,462. Yes, you heard me correct. You've probably noticed a theme this earnings season. Companies are blaming the strong dollar for dismal quarterlies. In fact, a recent fact set report noted that currency was the most popular topic discussed this earnings season by S&P 500 companies. This week's Market Monitor has some smart ways to protect your portfolio from currency upheaval. Last time he was on, in January, his picks were National Grid. It's off 7%. J.P. Morgan, which is up 22%. And the biggest of all, Google, which has jumped 29%. Jamie Cox joins us now. He's managing partner at Harris Financial Group. Mr. Cox, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thank you, Tyler. You know, nice yeah, to be with you. We, we just mentioned that uh, so many of the earnings reports, and particularly the revenue reports, reference currency headwinds. Uh, and that is why revenues, uh, one reason why revenues for a lot of companies seem to have come up short. Is that your view, or are they just using this as a fig leaf? Well, I think it's true. I think if you look at constant currency, most of the revenue picture looks a lot better for most companies. So I, I don't think that's I don't think that's an egregious statement this particular quarter because the dollar did spike going into both the first and second quarter. So I think companies have a legitimate non-weather related reason to you know, complain about their earnings. This Do you earnings think season. the dollar will likely strengthen from here or roughly stay where it's been for the past few months between about 105 to the euro and 110? I don't see that it goes up much further than this. Mm -hmm. I think we're all anticipating interest rate rises coming in the in the either, either the third or the fourth quarter, and I think markets have already priced that in. So I don't unless the Fed raises rates faster than what we think, I think the dollar is where it's going to be for some time. Nice to see somebody from down in my home state of Virginia. All right, let's <laughs> let's talk about a couple of your picks and why you think they are rather more insulated uh, from. Uh, from currency headwinds. Let's start with Rockwell Automation, a stock that has been uh, moving below uh, its moving average in, in recent days. I guess you see this as a buying opportunity. Why? I do. Rockwell has been undergoing a, a major transformation in its, in its systems over the last three years. And finally, we're starting to see them uh, divest businesses that are low margin, like their seat business and some of their car interiors. And they're actually in introducing businesses like their stop-start batteries. So in Europe, we've been using start-stop batteries for quite some time. Hybrid and electric vehicles use those batteries, and we think that stop-start batteries will actually be part mm -hmm. of the general population of cars. Management is giddy about that, let, and I think it's going to be a major uh, headwind. Let me or, move us quickly then to, your, to a second yeah. pick. It's a little out of order, and that is Johnson Controls, which has a kind of similar story about automobile interiors and the like. Th that's true. In, in, in addition, I think that both Rockwell and... Um, and uh, um, in this particular company, you, what you have is an opportunity for integration of systems. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they were early pioneers in the Internet of Things revolution, where they took offline systems and integrated them to bring the data online for management to use. Now these companies are actually downselling security solutions for companies. And I think that's where they're going to make right. a lot of money. It's being under underutilized, under talked about. All right. Final quarter. one, uh, quickly, precision cast parts. What do they do and why do you like them? Uh, the airplanes. I mean, mm -hmm. think about the number of airplanes sold. Cast parts is absolutely the, the place to be if you're thinking the airplanes are going to be sold in, in around the globe. You know, you've, you've seen enormous numbers of airplanes bought. Precision cast parts is a place you want to be if you believe that story. All right, Jamie, thank you very much. Jamie Cox with Harris Financial Group. And coming up, how one entrepreneur was able to battle the odds, open a mortgage company at the height of the housing crisis, and turn it into a multi-billion dollar business. Watch next week. Dow Component Cisco reports quarterly results. The Federal Reserve Presidents Bill Dudley and Dennis Lockhart are going to be giving some speeches. And on the uh, data front, uh, retail sales are out. Very important one there. Producer price index, that's a key read on inflation. And we'll also get the industrial production numbers. That is what to watch next week. Well, the high stakes game of house flipping, it's always been around, but now the practice of buying and selling a home in the same year 
is solely for profit, is getting a whole lot riskier, but also more lucrative. Diana Olick has our story. Taking a house from this to this takes a lot of cash, but in today's competitive housing market, it is a necessity for investors who hope to make big profit flipping homes. The market has gotten tougher, and so it, 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 it's not for novices. You have to know what you're doing, and you have to be able to do a good job. You have to have an eye for detail, um, but with that comes the reward, which is a better reward. Chris Harrison put nearly $400,000 into renovating this Washington, D.C. home after buying it for $700,000. It's currently listed at just over $1.4 million. It's a calculated risk. Um, the numbers in this neighborhood are very strong. Uh, the days when the market are short. Higher home prices have pushed a lot of flippers out of the business. Flips made up just 4.5% of sales in the second quarter of this year, according to Realty Track, and that's down from a year ago. Gross flipping returns, however, increased to nearly 36%, up from 24% a year ago. Investors are now making an average $71,000 before renovation costs, up from $50,000 a year ago. Today's buyers want not only turnkey properties, they also want the high-end finishes. So for flippers, that means more cash up front and more risk to returns. We're actually seeing a lot of flippers getting out of the business. You know, I know one flipper who is getting into home remodeling now because he doesn't want to take the risks that are associated with flipping anymore. Um, so if you're in it, you need to proceed with caution, um, you know, do the high-end deals. Flips on the lowest end of the market are actually losing money, likely because of the renovation costs. Flippers are seeing some of the greatest returns in the two to five million dollar range. And regionally, Nevada and Florida still see the most flips because they have the most distressed homes, but Chicago, Dayton, and Baltimore are giving flippers the best returns. If you're in the flipping business now, you have to know what you're doing. It's not for somebody who sees HGTV and thinks, oh, I can get in and flip. Flipping today takes more patience, more time, and ever more cash up front. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Diana Olick in Washington. To read more about uh, house flipping and the risks and rewards involved, head to our website, nbr.com. Well, from house flipping to home finance, a young entrepreneur, just 29 at the time, decided to open a mortgage business aimed specifically at home buyers, not refinancers, just before the financial crisis hit in 2008. You probably think that wasn't a very bright idea, but it was and is. And that young entrepreneur is Casey Crawford, a former professional football player in Charlotte, North Carolina. Man, this looks fantastic. Dramatic, unexpected turnarounds are Casey Crawford's thing. As a football player, he wasn't drafted out of college, but he managed to spend two years as a tight end with the NFL's Carolina Panthers. Then he got cut, but wound up signing with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in 2002, a season that ended with a Super Bowl victory. I need to set up a call with the head of sales. Crawford began to flip homes while he was still playing football. It was the early 2000s, and real estate and the real estate bubble were blowing up. I think I heard Donald Trump say this, and he's probably right, said the only way to be wrong in real estate at that time was to not buy something. Crawford was doing so well that he quit football after the Super Bowl. It worked out fine until 2007 and 08, when bad loans began to kill off giant lenders like Countrywide, American Home, and Wachovia. Evil, right? They have been defined by greed. They're defined by um, lack of integrity, right? Putting families into loans they couldn't afford. Despite the chaos, though, Crawford sensed an opening. He wanted to build a mortgage business that would help keep people within their means. Think about a lot of guys like Warren Buffett. Who say the time to get in the market, right, is always in the midst of chaos, right, when the blood's running in the street. Of course, he didn't know how to start a mortgage bank, so he did what anyone would do. He Googled it. Jump right on Google, how to start a mortgage bank. <laughs> a year later, in September 2008, Crawford's Mortgage Company, about 20 people, opened hey, for Taylor, business. We, we had a full 30 days before October of 2008, and just the whole financial world totally comes collapsing down. I spent about 60 days sucking my thumb in a closet, uh, trying to explain to my wife why this had been such a good idea a year earlier. Slowly, though, things did get better. In 2009, they did about $180 million worth of loans. Now, the company's called Movement Mortgage. It's 2,200 employees, yes, 2,200, expect to do more than $7.5 billion worth of business this year. 
Movement is building a new headquarters just across the state line in South Carolina. When it opens next year, Crawford says he'll create 600 new jobs. The jobs alone can turn into life-changing opportunities, but Movement isn't leaving Charlotte altogether. What Movement Foundation is offering us is something I have never seen. Colin Pinckney runs the Harvest Center, one of several nonprofits that will begin sharing a new office space called the Movement Center in Charlotte this month. Crawford hopes the center can become a sort of one-stop shop for the people who depend on the services they'll find there. They don't just need food, they don't just need job training, they don't just need mental health services, they need that whole suite of products. And the problem is often they find those all over a town, right? And that's really difficult if you don't even have a car to get to all these places. I think that's going to be important not just for our city, uh, but across the nation. A privately funded, scalable model for nonprofits across the country? Imagine that. Instead of leaving a trail of foreclosures behind, a mortgage company trying to build a better city. A turnaround, great, indeed. Thanks. I mean, if the great business minds, I think, in the United States would really get passionate about solving the problems in the U.S. and not leaving that to the federal government, I think we'd transform communities across the United States. Interesting fellow. Well, we've mentioned before how non-bank lenders have so quickly grown into a significant force in the mortgage business from about 11 percent of loan volume in 2011 to 37 percent last year. These companies say they're simply setting customers straight on how much house they can truly afford and trying to do it before they ever begin looking at homes. And that, folks, is Nightly Business Report for a Friday evening. I'm Tyler Matheson. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great weekend, everybody. We'll see you back here on Monday.